All right, let's turn our Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 13, Acts chapter 13. We want to deal with mission fundamentals tonight. We believe very strongly in missions, which is why we have, we support so many missionaries, which is why I believe we also have so many missionaries that are out of our church. What a blessing that is. But we need to be reminded about some things about this matter of missions and some truths that we need to stick to. The easiest way to lose what you've got is stop reminding people of the truths that brought about what you have. And we need to always have certain convictions to keep us moving in the right direction. I want you to notice beginning in verse 1 of Acts chapter 13. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon. That was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia. And from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John to their minister. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you, dear God, for the instruction that you give us in your word, which we believe is the final rule of faith and practice. And we talk about missions, whether it be uh, missions going or missions giving. Dear God, I pray that we would stay scriptural down the line and be faithful to the work that you've called us to as a people, as your church. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Now, of course... Madison Baptist Church got started at a missions, as a missions church. Brother Tony and Brother Ken Love began it. Brother Ken was a missionary out of uh, BIMI. And, of course, um, he was busy going around to churches that were struggling and helping them get back on their feet or getting churches started where at one time there had been a church. You know, there are some churches out there that have in their name Missionary Baptist. Now, I've discovered this isn't true of all of them, but of a great number of them. Uh, they hadn't sent out missionaries in years. Missionary Baptists, having it in the name is not enough. It needs to be real. Having it in your practice is where it really counts, whether you have it in your name or not. Uh, when the world hears of missionaries, often they think of people who provide some kind of necessary social service, whether it be medical missions or whether it be providing food uh, to the poor countries and people who are starving. That's what the world thinks of when it thinks of missionaries and missions. But we know it's got a greater spiritual meaning than that and a greater spiritual goal. It's not that helping people that are down or and out or on the on the brink of starvation. It's not that helping those folks is wrong to do, but the truth is they cover up the real meaning of missions. More than bread, they need the bread of life. And the bread of life is Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing. When the Bible speaks of missions, it's the missions of winning the lost to Jesus Christ. But that is not all. In the scripture, we've got some very clear commands for the church. Jesus said, go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, now that leads you then to the next thought. Well, what's next? Do you just preach the gospel to them and then just leave town? And that's the end of it. Well, of course not. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, he says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. And then we think of Acts 1.8, one of the last things that the disciples heard before Jesus ascended up into heaven. When he said, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. But you know, it took the church a while to obey him. Uh, now, it started out okay. He had told them to tarry in the city of Jerusalem until they be endued with power from on high. So we don't have any trouble with the thought that they didn't witness to anybody that first day after Jesus ascended up into heaven. 
And he didn't witness, they didn't witness to anybody the second day. As a matter of fact, it wasn't until the tenth day when they heard that sound of a rushing mighty wind and the Holy Ghost of God filled them. Then they went out and preached. But the sad truth is there was no missions going out to the uttermost parts of the world for really many days, perhaps several months. And so God had to do something to get them going. The Bible says in Acts chapter 8, if you'll uh, turn over there just a moment, Acts chapter 8 beginning in verse 1. This is after the stoning of Stephen. It says, And Saul was consenting unto his death, And at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, notice the therefore. They that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. He had told them to go into all the world and preach the gospel, and they were all staying in Jerusalem. They had won many people to Christ, and they were all staying in Jerusalem. They were teaching them to observe all things whatsoever he had commanded them, but they were staying in Jerusalem. Now, Jesus had made it very plain that that gospel was to be preached in the world. I believe because of their disobedience, God sent Saul, who becomes Paul later on. You understand, he was instrumental in the spreading of the gospel before he ever got saved, but in kind of a negative way because of the persecution that he put on the believers in Jerusalem. Therefore, they were scattered abroad and went everywhere preaching the gospel. So this was not an organized movement or a concerted movement of the church, God had to spread them out to do what he wanted them to do. Now, God's going to have his stuff done. And just like Mordecai told his uh, niece, Esther, that, uh, you know, you can do it, but if not, then God will judge your house and raise up someone else will get it done. Now, I'm not quoting it, obviously. I'm paraphrasing uh, the thought of what takes place in that story But the reality is God has a great work to do. We can be part of it or not, and somebody else will do it. I'd rather be part of it. And you're part of it by doing what he told us to do and getting out the gospel of Jesus Christ. It just took a while for the church to obey. But the first real church-led, organized missions effort goes to the church at Antioch. And I'll remind you, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 11 that they were called Christians first at Antioch. Not at Jerusalem, but at Antioch. And we see it begins with a prayer meeting. As we look at some of the ingredients to God's missions work that is so evident in this story and essential to the New Testament church today, it is important that we not take the theology of missions for granted. However, be careful. Uh, There are a number of mission books out there, good men that have written on missions. Some have come from mission boards. Uh, Some have come from good men who have dedicated their lives to missions. But you will read, if you read many books like that, you'll read about the doctrine of first mention. That when something is mentioned the first time in the scripture, pay attention to it because it is foundational for the rest of what is taught. When it comes to mission, you better be careful about that because you find when the disciples first went out, there are a number of things that they didn't do later on. You understand, for instance, Madison Baptist Church, when it came to local church missions as it's practiced here, as it's practiced today, we were flying by the seat of our pants. We didn't have a great clue. Most missionaries at the time that Brother Tony went out from Madison Baptist Church, there were not a whole lot of churches that were sending out their own missionaries. I know they were called sending churches and home churches and things like that, but the reality is most things were done through mission boards and that there were a lot of churches and pastors who would not have a missionary to come and present their work if they weren't under a mission board. Now, today, that has changed a lot. 
to where now, and it's not all because of the missionaries from, from Madison Baptist Church, but God has been doing something in this country and sending missionaries simply out from their local church with their local church taking responsibility for those missionaries as they go out. And we understand that with all that's involved in that, uh, listen, there's an awful lot of responsibility on the sending church in taking care of those missionaries, making sure they're taken care of financially, making sure that they're taken care of in issues back home while they're gone. But you see, Paul didn't have to deal with any of that stuff on that first missionary journey that he went out, sent out by a local church. And you'll find that when the apostle Paul went out on his first missionary journey, he did not spend very long at the churches that he started. As a matter of fact, he'd be there for only a week or two, and then he would be going off to the next town to win people and organizing them. And then as they came back through, he appointed elders in those churches. At that time, early on, you understand that the pastors basically were novices. Later, he says, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, that the pastor's not to be a novice. But you understand in the beginning, it's kind of like in marriage. Uh, you go back to Adam and Eve. Well, who did Adam marry? Eve. That was it. All right, they had children. Who did they marry? Their sisters. People are horrified when they think of that. Well, who else was there? That was it. And you understand they didn't live in the cultural system that we have today. Things were definitely, totally different. Now, when Paul goes out on later missions, we find him, for instance, spending three years at Ephesus. He spent 18 months at Corinth getting those churches going. So he found as they went out, not only that, remember the necessary things that are talked about for the Gentile churches in Acts chapter 15? Well, in the epistles, the apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, added an awful lot of things to those necessary things. Just read through 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, and Ephesians. Man, they're talking about all kinds of things that are not among the necessary things, and yet they're just as necessary. So there's a whole lot of things that change. Be careful of the doctrine of first mention. It is not a coverall. That is always the same because in the church, they're starting out. These are the first missionaries to go out on a church mission. So let me give you some of the essentials of missions with this. First of all, the originator of missions is God himself. You look at verse 2, and it says, And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. He is not just the one who gave the command to go, but he is the originator of the mission program to begin with. But it didn't begin here. It actually began with his own son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He sent his own son on a mission. By the way, you don't find the word missionary in scripture. It's not there. You can read through it. But obviously, by definition, the word missionary means somebody on a mission. It's what they do. Well, what is the mission of a local church missionary? To win people to Christ. Well, what happens when they get one to Christ? Well, they can't just be left behind. Somehow they need to be taught. And the missionary does have a responsibility for that as well. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the, the, uh, the law to redeem them that were under the law. The Bible says in Isaiah 53 and verse 12 that it pleased the Lord to bruise him who his own son. He sacrificed his own son. And this is the message. This is foundational to the gospel of Christ because before he could be raised from the dead, he had to die. And he died with a purpose to pay our sin debt, gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. 
And that message of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, it is called simply the gospel. One time it is called the gospel of the kingdom of God. Another time it is called the gospel of the blessed God. Another time it's called the gospel of the grace of God. Eight times it is called the gospel of God. Eleven times it is called the gospel of Christ. It is also called one time the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and one time the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You see, his going to the cross, dying for our sins, being buried, raising in the third day to pay our sin debt. You've heard me say often, Jesus did a lot of wonderful things while he was on the earth. He taught great truths, but he didn't come primarily to teach. Had he taught and not died, we'd all still be lost. He had to go to the cross of Calvary and die for our sins. That's the main mission. Everything else comes from that mission. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, I know the Greek word is a word that simply means that means the good news, and it is good news. But you've got to have the right news. You've got to have accurate news. The good news is not just any good news. Do you realize you can preach truth about heaven and never give people the gospel? You can preach truth about hell and never give people the gospel. It is the gospel of Christ that is the power of God unto salvation. And then when it came to the selecting of missionaries. Now, Jesus uh, selected apostles. Now, the very word apostle means one sent forth. That has the idea of missions. And obviously, the apostles ended up going out and preaching the gospel and winning others to Christ. But here, as far as local church missions is concerned, we find the first example taking place at Antioch. And in verse 2 here, it is God who selected the missionaries. It says, and they, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. Now they already had at the church, they already had other people serving. Evidently Barnabas though was the pastor. You think, why wouldn't God be calling one of these others? Paul was the assistant pastor at that time. Those are the two that they called. Boy, when the pastor and the assistant pastor both get called out, what's the church going to do for leadership? God will take care of it. I mean, God just takes care of it. He knows who he wants, where he wants them, and just trust God and obey God. The desire of every person at Madison Baptist Church ought to be to do what God wants you to do. If he calls you into his service, then you ought to be willing and ready to go. I've heard stories, testimonies of people fighting God. God had called them and they fought the call for a long time. Why? Why would you fight the call of God? The call of God is the right thing in your life. And, and don't pretend to tell God where it is that you're going to go. Don't tell God where you won't go. Now, there are a lot of places I don't want to go. But if God called me, I'm going. I mean, I just settled that a long time ago. For instance, I got awful close to San Francisco just a couple weeks ago to preach. That's one of those places I don't care to go. I can think of other places I wouldn't care to go. But if God called me there, then bless the Lord, I'm going to go. Now, for years, I've been willing, I've been willing to go to a foreign mission field. Now, believe me, I love my country. I want to see my country turn back to God. But if God called me to another country, I'm just going. At, at 74, if he called me, I'm just going. Why? Because I want to do the will of God. Now here he calls Saul, who in chapter 14, they start calling him Paul uh, a little bit later on. And they call, he, they, he calls Paul and Barnabas or Saul and Barnabas to go out. And it says, and when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So here we've got a church being commanded to send out these individuals that he has called. Now, things were a little bit different back then. Things were a little bit different in that there weren't a whole lot of places they could go to raise support. As a matter of fact, we don't find them raising support. We find them just going. 
As far as we know, we don't have a record of their home church being the church at Antioch. We don't find a record of the home church sending them support. We know of one church that did support the Apostle Paul with gifts, not necessarily monthly gifts or even yearly gifts. And that was the church at Philippi that sent gifts to help take care of the Apostle Paul. And we understand that according to our language today, that Paul was a bivocational missionary. He worked. He was a tent maker. He provided for himself where he was at. Now, he lets us know in 1 Corinthians and also 2 Corinthians that he had every right to expect those churches that he started to take care of him. But he did not charge them. And an interesting statement about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he says to the church at Corinth when he's discussing how he didn't take anything from them, he says, forgive me this wrong. This wrong that he didn't teach them to take care of him. He should have taught them to take care of him. Now, he wrote that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, in our church, you can look back here. We've got uh, three there and three over here to the United States, so that's six. Three for Africa. We got, uh, I think, six in Brazil. We got four in Spain. We've got, uh, I know, it, we actually, yeah, we got actually, yeah, Norwoods are down there. So we got five. What about Mexico? Do we have Mexico down there? We've actually got four because you've got to add Brother Cerrone to that there. And uh, we've got South America. We've got missionaries down there. We've got three families over in Korea that Madison Baptist Church has sent out. I believe God called them to go. I believe God called them to go. And this church evidently believed God called them to go as well. For we laid hands on them and we separated them. We're commanded to pray for laborers. We prayed for laborers, and God sent people out. Now, for some of you, I want you to realize this. When we pray as a church for laborers, we might be praying for you to go. I mean, without mentioning your name, this church was praying, and God sent two people out. Who's he going to send? Who he wants? Were these other people not qualified? I believe they were perfectly qualified. But God didn't want everybody to go on this first missionary journey. So remember, they took John Mark with them. John Mark ended up turning back. And we don't find anywhere where God called John Mark to go. He called Barnabas and Saul. I think there might be some lessons there. We need to be careful. Some people don't belong out there until God calls them to go. Then the, there's the originator of the missions. Then there's the organization for missions. And that's the local church. You look at verse 1. And it says, now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Notice they were in the church at Antioch. By the way, this is not a message against mission boards. Any reputable good mission board will tell you that they are under the authority of their pastor and their local church. They're not under the authority of that particular mission board. Now, if they do find out that that missionary that is not representing them by practicing or teaching what that mission board believes, they will let them go. But the reality is they can't bring them home. That's up to the local church to do that. The local church says, no, we want them out there teaching what they're teaching then they've got a right to do that. But it was the local church at Antioch. They provided the supplications. That is, they fasted and prayed. This is important for who we ever send out any time. That we fast and pray. You understand that fasting is a New Testament practice. It is a New Testament doctrine. The Apostle Paul tells us that he was involved in fastings often. Fasting is good. The truth is, most of the time and most churches are not serious enough about anything to actually go without food for a while. Now, you may be a diabetic and you say, man, if I fasted, I'd go into a coma. Well, then don't fast. 
Okay, pray. Do without some other things other than food, you know. There's other things you could do without. How about giving up TV for a day? How about giving up your cell phone for two days? How about, boy, that's a horrifying thought. Some people are starting to go into shakes. Just the thought of that. It's amazing how much those things have gotten to where they absolutely control our lives. I'm just, listen, I, I, mine doesn't even play a, a what, what is that? A notification. It, it, it'll, <laughs> it'll vibrate, but I'm so fat that I don't even feel it vibrate. I, you, you send me a text, I may get, get it tomorrow. You just don't know. Well, Brother Greg, what are you laughing at? <laughs> well, amen. <laughs> but you notice with this praying, it wasn't a conglomeration of churches that was doing this. It was one local church. There was nobody else to tell them how it should be done. There was a need. They sent them out. Now, if you look at the map, they didn't cover a great section of the world. They covered the center part of Turkey and a few islands off the southern part of Turkey. That was pretty much it. On the very first missionary journey, they went out. They won some people. They ordained some elders to lead them. Now, we don't know anything about these elders as far as how many of them were Jewish uh, that had become believers and how many of those were Gentiles who had become believers. God doesn't tell us that. And so evidently it's not that important. But the, by the way, let me remind you, the invisible church did not do this. This was a local church. People can talk about the invisible church all they want. It doesn't do anything. The invisible church doesn't do anything. Universal church doesn't do anything. You understand, the invisible church doesn't support missions. The local church supports missions. There is no meeting for the invisible church to take on missionaries or to call a pastor. Not only that, it provided some of the support. They sent them. We don't know how much they sent with them. I mean, after all, that had been pretty tough without a mailing system back then to be able to keep up with the monthly giving to these people how would you do it put it in the local bank i don't know that help you they pretty much went out on their own this is where you've got to be careful about the so-called doctrine of first mention because you look at how they went out the first time we were doing that way a whole lot of people wouldn't be going out at all today they wouldn't be able to get out as a matter of fact we find the apostle paul taking up offerings in the churches that he started to send back. Now, how do you think that go over if we told our missionaries, uh, when you start a church, we want you to teach them to start sending money back to us? Boy, that would create some problems, wouldn't it? But then we're not, we're not commanded to do that. We're not told to do that. But that's how it was done in the book of Acts early on. Doctrine of first mention, sometimes that could get you in a real mess, couldn't it? Not only that, they received reports. In John chapter, or Acts chapter 14, yes, Paul did go back to Jerusalem, and after he would come back through Jerusalem to talk to the apostles, he would then go up to Antioch, and he would give a report to the people at Antioch. Why on furlough, when missionaries are on furlough, do they go around to the churches that support them? To give a report for what God has been doing so that people can pray. You understand that apart from epistles, the reality is they didn't even have prayer letters back then. They couldn't send them back like that. That didn't take place. That doesn't come along until later. So we see the organization for missions. It still breaks down to one thing, and that's the local church. And like I said, most of the mission boards will tell you they're there to help local churches get their missionaries to the mission field. That is what they're about. So I'm not preaching against mission boards. I want you to understand that. Then there's the operators of the missions. You say, who's that? That's the individual believers. You see, he did not create organizations to go. He sent out individuals. 
Please understand that. He sent out individuals. He called them by name. In verse 2 and 3 of chapter 13, they surrendered. In chapter, or in verse 4, they sailed. In verse 5, they spoke. That is, they preached the gospel. In Acts chapter 13 and Acts chapter 14, they not only preached, but they suffered. Not only did they suffer, Paul was even stoned at one point and carried out of the city of Lystra for dead. And when he was brought back into the city by his companions, after that night of sleep, he got up the next day and went over to Derby and he preached some more. Missionary life was not easy. Missionary life was very difficult. As a matter of fact, you'll find studying the book of Acts that Paul was, he had a record. I'm talking about a jailhouse record. He was in a number of different jailhouses and we honor him for his mission work. It wasn't easy. It was very, very difficult. And I wonder sometimes, and yes, I, man, I want to protect all of our missionaries that are out there. But the reality in the history of the church and of missions, sometimes missionaries die on the field. Sometimes they die by violence. Sometimes they're beaten. Sometimes it's extremely dangerous to go to the mission field. Sometimes they'll go to mission fields that if they're found out, they're going to be thrown in jail. And nobody's going to be able to help them. If they are not ready for that, they really don't have any business going. It's not going to be easy. God doesn't mean for it to be soft. It's not soft. Paul says he beat his body into subjection in chapter 9 of the book of 1 Corinthians. It is hard. Paul went through it. He tells us in 1 Corinthians, he went through it for their sake. That through their suffering, through his suffering, going out for them, that it would show that those that he was going out to reach, how much God felt for them to send him to go through that for them. Now, so they not only suffered, but also in chapters 13 and 14 of the book of Acts, we find that they also succeeded. I mean, if you don't go... Guess what? You're not going to accomplish anything. What is it that God wants you to do in your life? Yes, souls hang in the balance. Souls hung in the balance. The reality is that you realize most of us that are here today, that if, we, if God would trace the line from who went, won you to Christ or started the church that led to your salvation or whatever, that it would get back to Paul and Barnabas. Somehow back there, it would be getting back to their going out. And they went out when nobody else went out to start churches. That's what they were doing. They went out when there became a question about their practice brought up before the Jerusalem Council in 50 AD. The apostles were still at Jerusalem. They hadn't left. They didn't leave during the persecution. They were still there. Later, they went out. After Philip the deacon went to the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8, we find that then Peter and John went up to see what was going on in Samaria. This, this is amazing stuff, but world missions, reaching people around the world, began here through local church missions. Paul even won some of his jailers to Christ. For instance, the Philippian jailer. He won his jailers to Jesus. So, with all that, then we have the objective of missions. These missionaries were not sent out to build hospitals. They were not sent out to start schools. They were not sent out to teach people agriculture. They went out to preach the gospel. I believe personally, this is not to offend anybody. I don't mean to offend anybody, but it seems like I'm pretty good at doing it anyway. But... Uh, there are a lot of things today that are called missions that are really not New Testament missions. For the most part, now I understand we use that word missions, but I have a whole lot of notes come across my desk, people adding us to add some school to our missions budget. I'm sorry, I can't do it. 
I just can't do it. Personally, I feel that the great majority of the money that comes in for missions ought to go to church planning, gospel preaching missionaries. Now, I realize that in today's world, there's needing some help. There's some, some help ministries. We have a help ministry here at Madison Baptist Church. It's part of our missions program. But we want to make sure that the great majority of our money goes to people who are out winning souls and starting New Testament churches. I believe that that is the biblical pattern for us. Some of this other stuff, I'm, I'm amazed. When I had one guy, he sent me a note saying, matter of fact, he even filled out one of our missionary questionnaires. When I looked for his field, he was going to stay in the States and teach Filipino pastors over the Internet on Skype how to pastor. Well, he doesn't need any money. What on earth does he need money for to live where he's at? This is nuts. And yet it's amazing all the different things that are called missions today. Then you've got the objective of missions. These missionaries were not sent out, as I said, to build hospitals, schools, and doing agriculture, but to spread the gospel. Verse 5, Scripture says, And when they were in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. So they spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 a moment. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul gives a testimony as to what he did when he went to Corinth. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. We like slick presentations. We like gospel films. We like just about anything that has something that looks quality on it. All Paul wanted was just to preach the gospel. Because he wanted that which was built to be done by the power of God through the word of God. Now I know we live in a multimedia generation. But we've got to be careful. The power is not in the program. The power is not in promotion. The power is not in slickness. We just simply preach. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. It is important. I know some people, they've gotten so sold out, and some churches have gotten so sold out to multimedia. What did God ever do before there was multimedia? How on earth did he get so many people really genuinely converted and saved. God's people praying, God's people preaching, and the power of God coming down upon them. That's how he did it. And that's how he's still going to do it today. We need to make sure that we're committed to that. So you've got the spreading of the gospel. You've got the saving of the lost. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. We see that in verse 12. Of the passage, then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. And then the starting of more local churches. In Acts chapter 14 and verse 23, why? Because people need to be taught. Now, our first seven missionaries that went out from Madison Baptist Church all went to the same country. They went to Uganda. And, of course, the first place that the church was started was there in Masindi. And out of that, there are, churches, there are churches all over Uganda right now. Some of them are daughter churches. Some of them are granddaughter churches and great-granddaughter churches. And when they have a preacher's meeting, just from those that were involved in Uganda Baptist Church and the work. Remember, early on, it was Madison Baptist Church in Masindi. 
but they didn't know what a Madison was, so I had to, they had to change the name to Uganda Baptist Church of Masindi. And, and, uh, and man, we got preachers all over the place that have sacrificed a lot and been faithful. What a blessing. And that's the goal. That's what it's about. Getting people saved, starting churches, growing them in the grace and knowledge of Christ. And so when you look at the gifts given to the church, he gives us the reason for that. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11. Now here's God's plan. Here's God's purpose. And he spells it out very clearly for us here. He says in verse 11, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I'm going to continue reading here in just a moment. It's important. He gave these to the church. A person that gets saved that doesn't want to be part of a local church is robbing themselves of the very things God gave for their spiritual well-being. Every believer needs a local church, an assembly of believers that God has given these gifts to. So he not only tells us what we just read, but that we, in verse 14, henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of man and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Notice, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body under the edifying of itself in love. That's God's plan in missions. Yes, winning souls. You have to win souls. That's first. And then you have to teach souls. You have to grow them. And teach them one thing, to go out and tell others, to win more souls and edify them to where eventually they're going out and winning more souls and starting more local churches. And it all starts all over again, sending out more people. Unfortunately, there's only a few churches that are really going after getting people saved, getting them grounded, sending them out to preach the gospel, to get other people saved and start more churches. I thank God that at Madison Baptist Church, our Spanish have that burden as much as the English do. It's the same. That's their burden. That's why we're starting a church down in Albertville, a Spanish church. That's why we're trying to start another one down in Arab. They've got a burden. They want to start more churches. Hey, they give to our Faith Promise Missions program. Without their giving too, we wouldn't have given a million dollars last year to missions. When I say Madison Baptist Church gave a million dollars last year, that's the whole church. The whole church, all of us. Because that is what God's heart is. It's the mission begun by the Savior by going to the cross of Calvary to pay our sin debt. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Dear God, challenge our hearts. Perhaps in a message like this, you might be calling someone to the ministry who need to surrender their lives to be part of this great program that you set up a long time ago. God, I pray. I pray that we would be a surrendered people. As a local church, may we continue to win souls and seek to grow them. And then, Lord, send them out to win more souls to Christ. God, I pray there might be somebody here that's lost and the only thing they've gotten out of this is the fact that they need Jesus as their Savior. There's one message and they've not received it yet. May they come to Christ. But Lord, bless in this invitation. May your will be done for I ask it in Christ's name.